morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here uh, as a replacement for Maria Isabella. As unfortunately, she can't be with us um, for this info share, but she's responsible for a lot of the organisation and the work that's that's happening here. So, um, thanks to her for that. So. Why are we working on data transfer nodes within the Shayant GN43 project? Um, initially, when the project was being formed late in 2018, there were a number of NRENs that expressed interest during the project proposal phase to take part in the project and do some work related to data transfer nodes and moving large volumes of data around. Um, some of those are, have been involved in this work um, and you'll hear more from, from those today. Um, that said, there is already good evidence of established best practices in moving large volumes of data across the RD networks. Um, in part, that's due to the Science DMZ model that was documented by ESNet several years ago. You can see that in the image on the, the right there, the general concept for a site. If you're a university, for example, and you want to move your data around efficiently, you put your DTNs at the edge of your campus, directly off your border router through lightweight um, security protocols, their access control lists, rather than homing them in your main campus behind a heavyweight firewall that might be doing deep packet inspection, etc. And you make sure those DTNs are well tuned, well configured on the sort of on ramp, if you like, to the NREN backbone through your border router. So there are sort of three principles to Science DMZ. One is the local network architecture as shown there as an example. One is having those well-tuned DTNs, which is obviously what we can hear a lot about today. And the third branch is worth mentioning is having good network monitoring in place. In particular, PerfSonar is recommended and PerfSonar is a <clears throat> package that's developed within the Xiaomi project in collaboration with partners in the US. Um, there's good ex examples of good practices that have evolved elsewhere, of course, the World Large Hadron Collider, Worldwide Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid is one of the best examples of that, moving data from CERN all around the world. That's been happening for several years. Um, there's other initiatives like the Pacific Research Platform in the US that are doing good work uh, in data transfers. And Sherwood itself as an organization, rather than the project, Richard Hughes-Jones in particular, I don't know if he's on the call, I've been involved in various DTN and data transfer work and tests. For example, the ANAS project, which is the precursor to the Square Kilometer Array project. That's a project where data is going to have to be moved around at 100 gigabits a second or more. And they've been doing some initial work in architecting a, an infrastructure to do that. And interestingly, a couple of years ago, Jelt demonstrated that you can get good data rates to Australia as well, AARnet, over the r and &E infrastructures. That is possible. But we needed to look at what the current position was um, with respect to the NRENs and their usage of DTNs. So we addressed that by running a, a survey last year. We asked several questions in that. We don't have time to go into all that today. Um, we asked about whether there was uh, suitable performance being observed by the NRENs, whether they felt users perhaps had low expectations if they tried to move high volumes of data using some perhaps naive tools like F plain FTP or SCP and it performed badly. Um, do they just give up and ship things by disk instead? Um, are they being impacted by firewalls? Are there general last mile issues? So we ran this survey and it came back and indicated that yes, there are some technical issues, but there are also non-technical issues. Um, so it's not just a matter of identifying best practices to a large extent those that has been done but it's also a matter of promoting those best practices particularly to the sort of longer tail of science the new emerging disciplines you know the, the CERN experiments they have an infrastructure that's evolved over the years they have the expertise there's a lot of emerging disciplines in the NREN communities that do need some help and the NRENs could play an important part in that so we've published the fuller results of that survey at the DTN wiki. There's the, the, the link to it there. So you can go and look at that and all the other resources we have at the, the DTN wiki. Um, so addressing some of the technical issues, what we've done, and you'll hear more about it in the next talks, 
if you've run some tests on the Geo test bed service, GTS, um, that's a Geo service. Anyone can apply to use it. There's a number of points of presence around Europe where there's infrastructure and you can set up virtual test beds on that. So um, we've used that infrastructure to demonstrate um, some data transfer tools and DTN configurations. So you can use bare metal servers. There's a limited number of those on GTS, but there's also plenty of virtual machines. And one of the interesting things we've done is containerize DTN tools using Docker. Um, so that potentially offers an easy way to set up DTNs for NRNs or anyone else interested in supporting data transfers. Um, GTS though, it only supports links up to 10 gig at the moment. So we're able to test up to 10 gig, but the encouraging news was as long as you're aware of using the right tools, ones that are okay in a, in a containerized environment, then you can get that 10 gig performance in a containerized environment. Now there's a, uh, you know, it's a common thought that if you're using containers, you don't get performance, but up to 10 gig, we found that's generally the case that you can. Um, and we've published guidelines for tuning those parameters for the DTNs. You can find similar things on sites like Faster Data, the ES Net resource. So that's all available on the DTN wiki. Um, and the DTN wiki is, we've put it up there as a way to help bridge these non-technical issues, to raise awareness of best practices and the tools that can be used to promote the tests that we've done um, and the available containers that you can download and use. Uh, and there's also a mail list you can join DTN Discuss there. That's open for anyone to join if you want to talk about data transfer node related things. Um, just some screenshots to show you the wiki. That's the, the sort of landing page. Um, and then there's the various topics down the left side of the tab there. Um, so here's the information about the Dockerized environment. If that interests you and you want to download those and, and try them yourselves. Um, and more specific information about the tests that were run over GTS. So um, if you're interested either in these tests or on using the Geon testbed service yourself, that's a good place to have a look. So finally, just to present what's coming up uh, in today's agenda, we've got Joseph Hill talking about how you tune data transfer nodes for optimal performance. We've got Jakobos talking about how he's dockerized DTNs. Um, and then Damir talking about the, the, the broader picture of the test we ran, both the containers and the bare metal. And then finally, we'll have time for some open discussion. If you've got questions, then we'll hopefully have time after each talk for those, and then we'll have a broader discussion at the end. And your input there is very valuable to us. Is there more work in this area that the Geo project should do? And if so, what is that? We'd love to, to hear from you. Okay, thank you. So. I'll end there. If there are any questions, obviously I'll take those now. If not, we'll hand over um, to the first talk. Thank you, Tim. So our next presenter is uh, Joseph Hill from University of Amsterdam Surfnet. And uh, while uh, Joseph is, pre is preparing his slides, uh, I would just like to thank Suzanne for beautifying the wiki <laughs> pages and uh, uh, collating uh, all the content uh, and contributions to the wiki pages. Um, Joseph, please. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, and we can see the slides. Excellent, okay. Um, so yes, uh, as she said, I'm uh, Joseph Hill from the University of Amsterdam. I uh, also do work with the uh, SERP and I've worked on DTNs for a number of years. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how do we tune DTNs. Um, so these are the areas I'm going to cover. Um, uh, tuning more in general and uh, how tuning and workflows uh, kind of interact together. Um, then I'm going to talk about three areas of tuning that is um, networking, storage, and architecture. Um, and the networking we're talking about is how to tune the network, networking on the end host. Um, uh, as Tim talked about uh, the science DMZ and the patent, the network that these DTNs live on is, is very important as well uh, to make sure you get optimal performance. But uh, for the sake of tuning in this part, I'll just be talking about tuning of the, of the individual hosts themselves. Um, so start up, um, so tuning. Well, why do we need the tune in the first place? Um, so the commonly defaults are there for compatibility, not necessarily the best performance. 
Um, and there's also the fact that the optimal setting may be different depending on how you're using the system. So you can tune for a variety of things. Uh, you can tune for um, maybe the most efficient transfer may be different from tuning that's necessary for the highest performing transfer. Um, you can also tune based on user experience. So for instance, if you are, um, if you want to tune so that a user has, a sending user has the best experience, then the idea is to get the data off that user's machine as fast as possible. So from their point of view, the transfer is done the quickest. This could be different than um, what someone, a receiver of data would, would see as the optimal performance. Um, so re, as a receiver, it's not just receiving the data, but it has to be in a format ready to use. So um, if they could stream data, then it's important that it's in order for them. Um, if they need the entire thing ready and committed to disk first, then, then there's different things you wanna do. Um, you can also optimize in a sense that uh, we want to utilize the least amount of network bandwidth to get the data across. So um, in reducing overhead is what I'm talking about here. So depending on what's important for you, different things are uh, different areas you're going to want to look at. So what I'm going to present here are um, the different areas that can be tuned and how they can affect these different workflows. Uh, I'm not talking about, I'm not going to tell you you should use this specific value in every instance because I, I really just don't think there is one right answer uh, that's for every workflow. Um, so with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so testing and tuning, how, how do we go about this? Um, one thing I think that is very important is that you test both before and after you do tuning. Um, so you don't want to apply a bunch of settings, then test, then see something's wrong and not know if it's something you changed in the tuning or maybe there's a problem initially. So really you want to test before and after. And you also need to think about what your use case is and what you're testing for. So there's times you're going to want to test to see what your network is capable for capable of rather than what the results of your actual workflow would be. So sometimes you want to know is, is this network really capable of doing, can I push 100 gigabits per second through this network? Forget about what my disk to disk speed is, I just want to know how good this network could be. Your ultimate use case, um, maybe you know, reading from one disk, writing to some other disk. In that case, you want to test from disk to disk transfers. Um, I'm going to talk about various uh, tools that we use to do this, uh, myriad of ways depending on what we're tuning. Uh, I'll get a bit more into specifics, but uh, here's just a few of the tools. Um, this is CTL utilities along with the proc file system on Linux, uh, the IP, uh, IP route two utilities, um, F tool. There are bio settings that affect these things um, as well as um, proprietary tools provided by vendors of hardware that you can also use. Um, we're gonna cover a lot of different areas here. Um, and while I've done a lot of DTN work and I have at least some experience in all these areas, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that I'm an expert in all of them. So give you my recommendations, um, areas I think you should look at, I think are important, but just understand it, it could be a little bit different uh, for everyone, what the best setting is. Um, so one of the areas, uh, one of the first areas we look at when we do tuning is tuning kernel parameters. Um, and this affects multiple things, but uh, in particular, they're used for network parameters. Um, there's two main ways of doing this, through the sysctl utility and the proc file system. <clears throat> These settings, for the most part, are the exact same settings you're changing. Uh, they have a slightly different way of referencing them. Um, the difference is that uh, sysctl, um, you can set them persistently so they get applied every time you restart a machine. Um, but the sysctl might not be available to a privileged user that just wants to read the settings where the proc file system would be. Um, so I have a couple of examples of how to set, um, how to set these values using both sysctl 
in the proc file system. Uh, for instance, with the CTL command to read it, you just type the CTL in the name of the parameter. Uh, for the file system, you can just do a cat or any other command that can just read from a file and get the output. Um, as you see, the naming is slightly different where the parameter name here is net.ipv4.tcp available for guest control. When you do this in the file system, they replace dots with uh, forward slashes and everything comes under the proc sys. Uh, one thing to watch out for is occasionally you'll have network interface names with a period in them, uh, is especially common with VLANs. Um, so when you use these with sysctl, you replace the dot with the forward slash. Um, hopefully I can save someone the uh, 20, 30 minutes of digging through documentation that I've spent uh, trying to figure that out before. Um, so networking. So talking about networking on the host, once again, um, we're gonna talk about a few different areas, um, socket parameters in general, um, TCP specific um, protocol parameters uh, and driver settings. Um, right here, I wanna get into a little bit about MTU. Uh, and this also gets into a bit about how different values under different circumstances. So one of the issues is um, jumble frames are, I would say, widely considered to be uh, in optimal performance tuning or a parameter that's often uh, increased for various scenarios. But it's not the default. And why is that? And I think a lot, to a large extent, this is because compatibility. Um, we're 15 uh, uh, MTU of 1500 will work almost everywhere. Even occasionally you have to reduce that to, for some overhead. Um, while 9,000 does get you better performance, if you hit a, um, a length that has a lower MTU, what will happen? And I've seen instances where a uh, transfer application will just not work. Um, there, are, there are means of detecting uh, MTU across a path, but they don't work as well as they should. Uh, and to a certain degree, this is, has to do with how that pathing in between is configured. So depending on your workflow. So if you are optimizing DTNs, uh, transfer between DTNs, and you have a fixed list of DTNs. So you always know that I'm going to be talking to another DTN that's on some fixed list. You can make sure that you have jumble frames enabled between all of them. And then it's a little bit easier answer to say, yes, you should be setting jumble frames, MTU 9,000. If you have a DTN that um, is more ad hoc, what, who the connections are going to be to, this could connect to any other DTN in the world, may want to establish a transfer uh, with this one. Then you have to be a little bit more concerned um, about what are the MTU detection capabilities of the transfer tool you're using. Because um, some tools will just stop if they, if they can't get that initial uh, communication going. Um, and in worst case scenario where you really need to make sure it works in most cases, then you may have to settle for a lower MTU just to be um, make sure you have the, the greatest amount of comp compatibility. And, um, that's why I say uh, also there's no one right setting. You really have to look at your use case. But in most, um, uh, especially research and education networks, you will see jumble frames are enabled. Um, <clears throat> something else that's commonly configured uh, is traffic control. Uh, so mostly this we're talking about uh, queue disciplines here. So this is a very broad, very complex thing in its own. So you have very basic uh, cues from first in, first out to far more complex quality of service, shaping. Um, I would say this is a more advanced area of tuning in that you really need to know the properties of, of how the protocol you're using works, how the application is going to react to the changes you make here. But this is also where you can um, set quality control so that I can maximize bandwidth for my protocol, but still making sure that uh, if something goes wrong, I reserve some bandwidth or I can set my control traffic at a higher priority. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a complex area, but it's uh, 
something you, you may want to take a look at. So here are some of the uh, kernel parameters uh, that we can talk about. These are um, the socket kernel parameters that apply to all protocols by default. Um, you can set them with either sysctl or using the proc file system. Um, so you have a few here, uh, there's different parameters for both sending and receiving. Uh, and there's two different sets, the defaults and the maximums. The default sets, uh, in this case, the buffer sizes for either the send or receive buffer size that an application will use unless it specifies something else. So it's important to note that your transfer application could decide to use a completely different value than what you set here. There's also a maximum value here. Um, this only applies to unprivileged programs. So if you were running a server, uh, a service like a grid FTP server and that service runs as root, it's free to change this buffer size even beyond the max set as a, a protocol, as the, um, the maximum for that protocol. As I said, those parameters were for, um, were set on socket. So they apply to all protocols by default. You can set TCP specific, um, parameters using a different set of parameters. Uh, but these are also set a little bit differently and how the two interact is also important to know. Uh, so for instance, you have these TCP uh, RMEM and TCP write mem parameters. Once again, one set's for sending, the, the write mem and the RMEM is for reading. The way they're set is very different. There's a minimum default and a maximum set here. The default value you set is what overrides the default value for the, the, the SOC parameters that apply to all protocols. Um, the minimum and maximum here are quite a bit different. Uh, the minimum and maximum you said here are how TCP auto tunes the, um, the buffer. So as the TCP uh, session is running, uh, the operating system can decide to adjust the buffer in real time anywhere between these two values. Um, how it goes about deciding between where in the in that range is based on another parameter. And this is the TCP mem parameter. This is also set with three values. Uh, low is where if you're below this level, this really this is how much memory TCP is using globally. If it's below this level, there's really no need for it to manage memory, so it, it allows. Uh, buffers to grow as they will. Above the value of pressure, then it says, okay, I need to manage memory. And so then it gets to the point where it's trying to reduce the amount of memory TCP buffers are taking up. The high value sets the maximum amount of memory. Uh, these are pages, by the way, not bytes, that the, all the TCP uh, sessions combined can use. Um, <clears throat> so once again, it's a there's some subtle differences in how these things are applied and how they interact with each other that people should be aware of rather than me throwing some numbers at you and telling you just use this. Um, there's also similar parameters for UDP, um, but they also have slightly different ways of working. And just due to the connectionless nature of UDP, you're going to tend to want, want to use very different parameters than you would from TCP. Uh, another very important um, parameter when you're talking about uh, TCP uh, settings is the congestion control algorithm you're using. Um, so first, um, what's available on a system? Um, by default, uh, Linux has a very limited set, uh, usually the uh, Reno and Cubic. Um, typically, newer congestion control algorithms such as BBR uh, are popular. Um, but once again, the defaults tend to go towards compatibility. <clears throat> you should also note that congestion control algorithm affects sending, not necessarily receiving. So if you want to have control of the whole session, then you need to be able to set it from both sides. Uh, a program, the system is, there's a number of parameters here. Um, there's what's available, what's allowed, and what's the default. So available is all the all the congestion control algorithms that the kernel is capable of doing. Uh, this set might be rather reduced until you load kernel modules that enable some more. 
Um, then there's what's allowed. Um, and this is once again, what an unprivileged program can use. So an unprivileged program can pick from any of the allowed congestion control pro uh, algorithms. A privileged program can choose any of the available uh, congestion control algorithms. And the, and the TCP congestion control parameter by itself just sets the default, um, but no one's required to use the default. Um, you can use the SS utility from the IP and route utilities to determine what congestion control protocol is actually being used by an open connection. Um, I'm sorry, uh, how am I doing on time here? Uh, three more minutes. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm falling behind quite a bit here. Um, so let me speed up a little bit. Um, another area for configuring network parameters is um, the, the network driver itself. Um, here, eth tool is one of the most common ways of configuring this. It's, it works for various uh, vendors' devices. Um, two key things you want to look at here, and this is ring buffer sizes and offloading. Um, so offloading is work that's done on the NIC instead of done by the CPU. Um, it's just, it relieves the load from the CPU if you have a lot of connections going on or high packet per second rates offloading can make a huge difference. Um, ring buffers um, are, work similar to the other buffer parameter settings. Larger buffers are usually considered better. They take a, in this case, you're not worried about using system memory, but um, you can have the possibility of increasing latency when you increase the size of the buffers. Uh, storage, so just like networking storage is very important for your end-to-end -end transfer because if the storage throughput is, isn't there, then you're not going to be able to push the bytes into the network to begin with. Um, storage comes in various forms, spinning disks, solid state disks, and they have different performance uh, as far as how fast they are versus the capacity sizes available, and even some concerns as far as durability. Um, you, the uh, storage also comes in different interfaces such as SATA or SAS or NVMEs. Um, NVMEs being the newer, faster way of doing this, um, which, uh, yeah, NVMEs is typically the, considered one of the better ways of connecting devices uh, for throughput performance. Uh, a few concerns when you're dealing with storage speeds. Um, you have the interface speed versus what the device internally is capable of. Um, so you might be connected to the system on an interface that supports six gigabits per second, but internally the drive isn't fast enough to do these things. And also internally a device may be faster doing read versus write. Um, you can also get read or write optimized drives, which can have uh, a bigger difference between the different between read and write performance. Uh, you can run into issues such as thermal throttling. Uh, this is coming with some SS, high, high performance SSDs where under sustained load, um, they'll overheat and actually slow down. Um, it's also just a matter of trim, which I'll discuss a little bit on, on the next slide, which is the more the devices use, the slower it may get. Uh, Trying to see what I can leave out here to speed up. Um, so if a single uh, storage device may not be fast enough to fill the network, um, so what you can do is aggregate storage devices together. This is typically done um, through RAID. Uh, so you can have a RAID controller, which has many hard storage devices attached to it. And depending on how you configure those things, uh, they present to the operating system as one large storage, one larger, faster storage device. Um, certainly with um, spinning disks, this is typically the way you're going to want to go. Uh, there's various caching methods you can use that will um, give you an apparent performance boost, uh, such as uh, write buffers. This is where you tell a system to write something to disk. It tells you it has done this when it really hasn't. It's written it to memory, and in the background, it's committing this. But 
to the user the, the appearances that this is already done. Um, obviously, if you have a continuous transfer, eventually it exhausts the amount of memory available to a buffer, and then you'll be dealing with the real uh, write through speed to the hardware. Um, what file system you choose um, can also have an effect on your performance for storage. And this typically shows up with some file systems being optimized to deal with lots of small files versus file systems optimized to deal with very large files. Um, trim, I think this is a pretty important thing I want to get into briefly. Um, so SSDs are a bit opportunistic in the way they perform their writes. Um, if they know that the storage device is empty, for instance, and you issue a write command, it will choose whatever place is convenient for it to write that data. As the device becomes full, um, there's less opportunity for it to do this. Unfortunately, as you delete files from an operating system, the storage device doesn't actually know that these areas are have been deleted, so it doesn't know the space is free, and so it can no longer do these opportunistic writes. Trim is a command that passes information through to the storage device that says, hey, this area is free. You can once again use it for these things. Um, the idea here is that there's big performance gains to be had from a device, from an SSD especially, knowing where it has free space. Unfortunately, the way trim works is if, you tr if you're trimming after every delete, it can actually substantially hurt your performance. So ultimately what this comes down to is the implementation of how trims are done. Typically the safe thing to do is when you form a file system, trim the disk so that all that area is marked as free. If you have a lot of um, read write cycles to a particular file system, eventually the hardware is going to think the disk is full. You're gonna lose its ability to do um, opportunistic writes, but doing real-time trim isn't really an option. Just something to be aware of why you may not get the performance you expect from SSDs. Um, sector size, uh, I'm gonna skip over this just to save a bit of time, but this is also a factor in looking at performance. Um, to briefly talk about architecture, uh, there's two ways you can go here, you can go I want very fast CPUs or I want a lot of CPUs. And this has to do with, typically this most affects multi-threaded applications versus single threaded applications. Single threaded application is going to work best on a high uh, frequency uh, CPU. Multi-threaded applications can spread this across multiple CPUs um, and gain performance in that way. This is different from using multiple TCP streams as some uh, transfer applications do. So for instance, um, Globus Grid FTP can do multiple TCP streams, but it tends to use only a single thread. So it's one thread that's managing multiple TCP streams. So there the actual best performance comes from that high frequency CPU. Um, other areas to look at are, um, uh, PCI Express, this is how devices attach to a system. Um, PCIe 4.0 is the, the newer way of doing this, which doubles the, the throughput you can have between the device and the system. Uh, but be careful with PCI uh, 4.0 because um, it's still pretty new and there's still some gotchas out there as far as um, I've seen motherboards where all the slots slot support PCI 4.0 but you can only choose one, uh, which you have to choose in the BIOS, and that's the only one that can be active on at the time. Um, so issues like these are out there, so just be aware of that. Um, sorry, I know I'm running over time. I'm almost through this. Um, a few more areas to look at uh, non-uniform memory access. This is where, when you do have multiple cores in a system, uh, they can be grouped into different NUMA nodes. This is the different cores have memory that's associated with them. So if a core has to access memory that actually belongs to a different core, there's a performance penalty here. You run into this a lot more with the new AMD systems than you do the Intel systems. Uh, so 
It also affects how devices are physically attached to the system as PCI slots are assigned to different NUMA nodes. So you may actually need to physically move a card, card in a system in order to optimize performance. Um, and the last thing I just want to say something about is power saving. Uh, when you're doing testing, you may want to turn off power saving because this will give you an idea of what your system's most capable of. Um, where in production, you might say, well, we want to be green, so let's turn the power saving on so that in times of uh, lower activity, uh, we can save a little bit of power. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, sorry for running over time. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone has any questions or I'll be around at the end as well. No problem, Joseph, thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe we can proceed to the next two talks and then we will have some more time for a Q&A session in the end. So our next speaker is Jakovas uh, Jano from uh, CYNET. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we Great. see your screen, but it is not yet uh, in full screen mode. Now it's okay. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Great. <clears throat> uh, uh, my name is Jakobos Ioannou. I'm going to present uh, the dockerized environment that is called set up for uh, DTN test. So the big question is, DTN test running in dockerized environment is a blessing or a curse? We will see in the following slides what uh, was uh, the result. So in this presentation, uh, I will cover basically what is Docker and uh, how we can use Docker with uh, DTN nodes and uh, how we can, uh, how, what, is, what are the steps to be followed in order to set up a Dockerized environment in GTS and the results. And at the end of the presentation, I will have a, present, a demonstration a video demonstration that shows uh, what is done in order to uh, install Docker on the GTS, install the scripts uh, that are needed in order to set up the containers uh, with the required uh, software. And then uh, in addition, I have a test script that I is running in order to transfer uh, 250 gigabytes from one node to another. Uh, so what is Docker? Docker is a, is a set of platforms as a service products that it utilize the OS level in order to deliver product in packages called containers. And basically containers are, are related immediately with the OS virtualization and they are not, I have to specify that, they are not virtualized systems inside. A, a container does not have a virtualized system. So containers run the required software that is needed, the service that is needed, in order to achieve a specified task to, to serve. Uh, to give a specified service. So containers are isolated from one another and they run their own software libraries and configuration files. Also, they can communicate each other through well-defined channels. One channel is the storage. You can have a mounting point that all containers can use. In the DTN, I, use, I utilize the slash data uh, that this was created in a file system in order to store the transfer files and to be common with all the uh, to be common with all the containers. Uh, let's continue. All containers are run. Uh, this is what I said before. In a single operating system kernel by a single operating system kernel and therefore with fewer resources than the virtual machines. The, the virtual machines, the, let's take one virtual machine. If uh, we start up a virtual machine, the machine as it is, it needs OS, it needs uh, 
uh, load the kernel, uh, it's isolated, it, it needs its own uh, specific uh, settings, uh, but it has its own, own isolated always in, in it. In uh, containers, we can specify a light kernel, kernel that can be downloaded. And then the services, we can specify the services that can run on this light kernel. For example, uh, XRubD, and even the port that it will run uh, this XRubD, and then uh, start util using this service. Uh, so this service, the Tokyo service is free and for all, for all the, uh, the users, it's open source and you can utilize it uh, uh, through docker.org. You can download it through docker.org and you can install it and it's called Docker Engine. Let's go to Docker Architecture. <clears throat> So Docker architecture, it's a client server architecture. Uh, it has the Docker Diamond service run on the server host. Uh, it's, it has on it the built-in uh, engine for containers. So basically on, the, on this service, we have the containers and how we can manage the, these containers. There are specific uh, APIs provided by the Docker in order to manage this service, build a container, run a container, or even transfer a container from one server to another. This is done using the REST API. So if, imagine we want to have also uh, disaster recovery service in our organization. Maybe something happens in, uh, uh, let's hope not in CYNet. And uh, I would, uh, I would immediately uh, with uh, transfer, I wanted immediately to my notes to be transferred to another server, to another uh, Docker engine. This is, can be done with using Docker Swarm, and I can specify it from before the, the, the next server that my Docker's will, come, will transfer. And immediately I will have uh, uh, up and running my softwares, even that I have a situation in CYN uh, that, uh, for example, uh, I have to move uh, the offices, and this kind of uh, important things to be done in an easy way. So Docker provides an easy way for uh, managing your services. As I said before, Docker client and Dima and, and Daemon communicate using REST API. They have also uh, uh, interfaces in order to use uh, Unix sockets or interface or network interfaces. Uh, so, what is the Docker architecture? Docker architecture consists of the following co components: Docker daemon that is running a service in our server, Docker client that is the client manager of this service in order to create therefore the containers to create, for example, an HTTP service. Uh, I want to make a, a launch of a new Apache server and uh, with this uh, utilizing with this uh, specific port. And uh, I need to also to, to instantiate it very fast. So I will use the client manager to connect the, the Docker client to connect to this service and make the image and run the image. There is a, in order to create the image, there is a specific Docker file. This is how we call it, Docker file. 
In this Docker file, you say, I want this to be a light kernel from CentOS. I want to install XRD. In the situation of Apache, I want to install Apache. And I want to open this port. I want to share this storage among the others. It's very easy to define, and you can find it from Docker.org. If you have any questions, you can send email, and I can reply in our mailing list how you can set up your own service. Now we are talking about DTN. So I have the scripts provided. I have the scripts that you are there. They are creating you the Docker server environment for you. And I have also provided to you the client scripts to create the DTN nodes in order to start transferring fast. Uh, so we have the Docker registry. The Docker registry stores the Docker images uh, like uh, uh, I can create my image of CentOS with XRD or, grid, or another image with CentOS with grid FTP. This image will be stored in the Docker registry. And when I want to instantiate a Docker container, I can, the Docker in five seconds, it can launch me the service without even uh, touching, uh, just running one command. It will create the Docker container based on the settings that I provide uh, for this pre-specified container. And what are the Docker objects? As you imagine, we have behind ROST, REST API, Docker has REST API services. These services uh, handle all the components of Docker uh, as objects. And what we said before are handled as objects in Docker in order to be handled also easy using the REST API and, and uh, utilizing the object-oriented uh, programming. Uh, so Docker objects, what we said before, are Docker objects. We have also the image. Uh, I have mentioned this. It's a read-only template with instructions for creating a Docker container. This can be written in Docker file, and this Docker file can be saved in a Docker in a registry at web called Docker Hub or at your computer. For our DTN nodes, the DTN files are in the scripts that are creating the containers. And these scripts are provided to you at the wiki page, in the Docker uh, page, sub page of the wiki, of the page of the DTN. So we have the container that is a runnable instance of an image that is predefined with the instructions the what we want to provide as a service. So, uh, therefore, what I said before, if we compare the virtual machines with the containers, you will see that containers gain speed, agility, portability, that's, that's the major reason that it's good to be used for the DTN nodes. The if, so, if you compare containers conta uh, with VMs, containers are small in this size. They are lightweight. They are sh uh, they use they use a shared operating system, the host operating system, and they can move multi uh, among multiple environments easily. Uh, they can they can utilize different workloads in each container, and they represent a con uh, and they can represent each container as a service, isolated service. VMs VMs are huge in size. They include their own OS, 
they perform numeric resource intensive functions at once. They use resources often two VMs uh, in order to permit, permit, permit them to abstract, split, duplicate, and emulate. So in VMs, the hardware is being virtualized and run uh, in multiple OS instance. So therefore, if we have VMs, we have their own operating system, their own OS intensive resources used by the operating system. Versus containers, we have a, a small disk size, use a shared operating system and use memory, CPU, and bandwidth and interface only when it requires by the service to be used. Why DTN on dockers? So for the following reasons, we install uh, DTN services on Docker because the, we can set up containers with specific services and these services can be isolated among them with utilizing one host IP address. We can have a common sharing folder. We can use unrestricted CPU memory and bandwidth. Of course, this is restricted from the, on, in the container. We can have restrictions in this through the Docker environment, but in, the, in our case, we unrestrict it, and this is restricted only to hardware limitations because we wanted to, to have the maximum efficiency in the bandwidth as it's, it's possible. Containers are light in terms of resource consumption. We can have multiple services on a Docker host. Also, Docker is written in Go programming that may take advantage of several features of the Linux kernel in order to increase its functionality. Docker, it's, it's, uh, it's used and constructed in order to provide flexibility, dynamicity, and easy integration on, on updates on containers. Why? Because uh, when I am DevOps, and I want to update, let's say, XROOT service. There is an update in the XROOT service. And uh, for example, I a bug in XROOT service. I will just put the source code, uh, the updated uh, Docker file. I will change uh, to point to the updated source code. I will build the image. I will download, I will say to the Docker, stop the container that has extra D, and I immediately start the container that has my image. In a few seconds, I can have up and running the new functionality of my service without having the procedure, install another virtual server, installing the server an operating system, and at this operating system, reinstall the image the new service from the beginning. Why GTS is selected uh, for this uh, uh, dockerized environment in order to make the DTM test? Uh, because uh, GTS is selected because it can provide the necessary resources to set up and maintain a dockerized environment. We have tested, we have installed uh, in um, and bare metal servers, on the bare metal servers, dockerized environment in which we have installed containers. And we will see which service we have installed on the servers, on the bare metal servers, and we test the transfer. So we have made three containers with uh, Docker files. Through this container, we have installed in, the, in one container the grid FTP, 
in the second container, the FDT, in the third container, the XRD. These three services uh, are providing uh, fast data transfer. Why we have selected these three, uh, these three services? Because they can run on Linux, they are open source. We have co good comments that shows the, that uh, they are fast in, in data transfer. They provide client and service uh, architecture as we want it in order to support huge file transfers. Therefore, I can have a client using the XROOT D client uh, software and transfer fast my data to the container that runs the XROOT D service. We, they are also isolated software without dependency. These are isolated without dependency on the distribution of Linux OS. We can have grid FTP for uh, CentOS and Ubuntu, and it can run beautifully, beautifully in both uh, distributions. So <clears throat> the above characteristics make the installation of DTN over Docker on GPTS very easy with the use of predefined scripts that we have created. One more minute, Jacobus. Ah, I will uh, run then. <laughs> And uh, we have uh, installed, run, uh, tested on virtual environments using Docker. Uh, the Docker DTN test, uh, in our test, we have client server logic. Uh, the scripts, we have three scripts. Uh, the first script installed the Docker service on the BMS server. The second script installs the containers automatically on the server. And the third script is run in the client server that transfers the huge data from the client to the server. Uh, we have prepared a package and we have also prepared manuals for installing the Docker, the Docker scripts, the Docker containers and run the client in the uh, in the wiki. <clears throat> so once uh, you are ready for testing, you have the GTS uh, up and running for you, you can start testing the Dockerize uh, BTN transfers yourself. And uh, we, within container and token, we can manage the memory consumption, CPU and caching, but as I said before, we have it unrestricted. And containers configured with services of grid FTP, XROD, and FTT separately, one container for grid FTP with a specific port, not the default port, with a, a specific port that we have put. Another container with XROD with a specific port that we have assigned, and another container with FTT we have specific port that we have assigned and three, these three ports share the IP of the host. We have used in order to see the, the statistics on the containers, the CTOP is a tool for, mesh, for showing memory consumption, uh, CPU and, um, and bandwidth. In the client side, in order to monitor the transfer of the data we have used, if top bmon and if IPRF in order to test the connectivity IPRF, bmon and if top in order to uh, see the bandwidth utilization in the runtime. Uh, the results show that there is minor difference between server and client with larger and longer distance. There's minor difference between dockerized environment and not dockerized environment. There is minor of difference between late hours of executing the dockerized environment or uh, work day. This is important because uh, we believe that in uh, regular days we can have um, less uh, traffic uh, 
and bandwidth utilization. Uh, we have performed the same test in the CentOS and the Ubuntu. So therefore, we conclude that Docker SDTN is a bless. I'm waiting also for your comments when you, if you try it in the GTS. Let's go to the, uh, as I said before, the scripts manuals are at the DTN wiki. Let's check the demonstration. Sorry for the timing. Here I will explain also the steps that we follow in order to install the Dockerize environment. We transfer the scripts at our first host, first bare metal server. We change then the permissions in order to have an execute provision in the server in order to run them. After this, I connect to the server and run one script, just one script that will install the Docker service. Here I run the script. It's very fast. You start, I will not let you see the whole process of downloading the, the packets. Now I have the Docker service installed up and running. I will go now to install the containers. I one minute to go back. Here I run the script to install the containers. When it, it finished, it automatically load me the C top in order, uh, in order to see the performance. So after, uh, after finishing, of installing the containers for the services. Um, uh, I have run the zip top and I have, I can check the performance. I will skip in order to go immediately for you to see. Now, you know, because time is limited, we have this video on the wiki. Let's wait. Um, yeah, because maybe we can later. Ah, here it is. Okay. Uh, so here we have the C top. Uh, the performance showing on the containers. Here we have the measurements in the, uh, the measure of the bandwidth utilization from the client. And here we have the movement using FDT, which is around 10 gigs, 9.4, uh, 9 8.9, it's not stable. Uh, that's it from me, sorry for, uh, taking uh, uh, so much time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jakobus. And uh, last but not least, uh, Daniel Regler from Carnet who will present the tests that we run on the GTS. Okay, hi guys. Uh, let me start the slide. Uh, I'm gonna present the, the what we did and with the test results and what the data were. Uh, why we why we use the GTS because this was only uh, thing available. We want to have a proof of concept about DTNs. I think by now you should get the idea why we need DTN. Uh, you have the storage devices. You have the data on the storage devices. You have the data on the disk drives. But this data needs to be prepared to be transferred over the network. So why we have the dedicated DTN node or DTN server or whatever you call it, because this server needs to prepare this data. Uh, this is what was tested uh, over the Jean testbed service. Uh, 
at the beginning, I would like also to thank uh, the Jean GTS people, especially Akil from the Jean, who helped us a lot with the testing and uh, tuning up uh, the GTS servers and the GTS testbed. So as you know, uh, GTS service is here for around seven years. It's actually a virtualization framework that you can use to deploy or test any other of your network services or whatever you like if you don't have your own infrastructure in your environment. What is good stuff that you can also utilize the, the giant optical and Lambda links between the nodes. So you can also perform, do some kind of uh, performance testing over longer distances. Uh, basically how you set up GTS service, it's web and click GUI. You put your nodes, your uh, machines, your virtual switches and everything else. You connect it with the lines and that's it. This is your, your test bed. It's a reservation system. And after you have that, you have your own test bed. Uh, basically what you have in the Jean test bed service, I will do this quick. You have the hosts, which are actually virtual machines in eight nodes that GTS is present inside the Jean network. They are implementing using OpenStack. Uh, you can set up virtual circuits, however you like between those VMs or hosts or servers. Uh, and what you can make whatever topology, virtual topology you like. You can also use uh, virtual switches instances like virtual switch that utilize open flow uh, software installations. And also what is new from uh, uh, Jean Tesbet services that you can also have your dedicated server. So no virtualization, no, no nothing that can concern you. Uh, for some of you guys, uh, you know that what Joseph is talking also, you need to have high performance service server for your test bed. So in GTS services, we had two servers, two flavors to pick up. One was Dell PowerEdge uh, server uh, R430, and the other one was R520. The 430 is the, we love it because it has a double processor unit with 20 cores. And the other one had only one processor unit with eight core. So that makes a lot of difference because the hardware component in DTN is very important. Also, the first one had a lot of RAM, unlike the other one. The uh, SSD is also, these drives are must have for the DTNs because you need to prepare your data for the network interface card. And the faster you, faster the disks you have and the faster network interface you have, and the processor units that segment the data, the better. Uh, <clears throat> how we test it? Uh, first of all, we want to, wanted to have some kind of baseline. What is the maximum uh, network speed for the file transfer that we have? So we use iPerfTor tools just to have the, the line, what is the top? You, what basically you want with ETN is to transfer the data as fast as possible. For example, if you have 100 gig links, you want to have it uh, up to 100%. This is basically not possible because of the segment of the data and preparing data for the network transfer. We tested uh, four DTN tools, uh, three DTN tools, sorry, uh, in our test bed, because these are the ones that can easily be installed. And there is also uh, Debian packages or very easy installation for this. Grid FTP is the very old tool some of you from the grid community are very familiar with it and it is uh, still being developed, but now it is in a Globus online uh, toolkit that you have to pay for. But grid FTP as a tool is a, uh, open source, but all service Globus online is something you have to pay. We also tested the fast data transfer tool. This is open source application that uses numerous TCP streams. And we also uh, tested X3D open source tool that is actually extension of a root daemon that is uh, using load balancing method between the clients and the server. And also the data is a uh, load balance and in the chunks for the prepare for the transfer network. <clears throat> in our test bed, we use Ubuntu 18.04 lifetime support uh, as a basic line operating system for all the DTN nodes. Uh, and also due to limitation on GTS, we only have 10 gig interconnection between our nodes that is usually done in GTS network to dedicated fibers or Lambda links. Uh, what is important now in GTS, you don't have the control 
over the real network. You know that there is a ten, uh, there is a dedicated fiber or dedicated lambda, but you cannot put any quality of service uh, instances inside the network. So somebody else who is doing other tests in GTS can actually uh, influence your performance uh, when you test something that requires all network performance. Uh, how, how we managed to skip that? We did all the tests during the night. So when everybody we were doing their own tests was sleeping, we did our own tests. So we got very good results. So here are the test scenarios that we use uh, with help of the GTS team. Uh, we send the 520 gigabyte data file as a basic line between the nodes. Uh, we use the virtual uh, virtual machines or VMs uh, in Amsterdam and London. Uh, which we tested uh, if there will be differences in uh, what the CPU uh, were assigned to each of the VMs. So we did London Amsterdam VM test, and we also did local test between the VMs in Amsterdam just to see if there is a difference uh, between. Uh, there's a difference if you do the local test or the test over the fiber. We also did the bare metal testings. Uh, between the links Hamburg and Paris and London and Prague, just to see uh, what are the differences. How does the network or the fiber influence the results uh, of the test? So basically, this is this is the test test results uh, for the virtual machines. You can get uh, 100 gig iperf test almost to the max. What is important with virtual machines that you have limited access how you can tune your virtual machines because they are hosted on hypervisor and you cannot uh, change or tune hypervisor. You get what you get. Uh, also, uh, with VM tests, we did memory to memory transfer. We didn't do disk to disk because the data would be much, much lower and we, you wouldn't get the high results. So, virtual machines are something you will not use for the DNs, although the Data looks promising. Uh, <clears throat> for the bare metal tests, we did uh, the testing with with uh, with plain configuration and also with dockerized uh, bare metal server. With what Jakob was, was talking, uh, we can see the influence of the hardware. With poorer hardware, we got the poorer results. So for the R five hundred and twenty, we got very bad results, and for the R 430 we got excellent results what can we see from the pictures uh, what we see also regarding to the tools uh, uh, x3d is the tool that is high, uh, currently very highly developed within the CERN community and other uh, dtn communities it is very dependent on the hardware resources because these tools like would like to use all the hardware components so the better the hardware components you get you have, you will have the better results. Uh, also, what Jakob was talking, we were also comparing the results between uh, the R30 Docker test and plain text. More or less, the hyper tests were more or less the same. And what we got the same result for the Greed FTP and rig 2 d but we had five to seven percent difference for for the uh, file data transfer test. Uh, Bear in mind that in, in GTS, we didn't test over 100 gig links because we didn't have uh, opportunity to have 100 gig links because the data would be very, very different. And with 100 gig uh, links and network interface guys, you would probably have a different, much more different results uh, for the test. Also, the DTN servers or DTN hardware that we, we got are not the high end. Hardware that will hardware that we will use for DTNs. For example, now you have folks that are testing for the hardware that have NVIDIA graphical cards that can use that are much faster and have better algorithms for segmenting the data or preparing the data for the transfer. Uh, also, the the fiber distances didn't do any much any bigger difference. There were some differences in uh, in in fiber uh, distances between the, the nodes, but these were not not very big, this community. Uh, you can probably see it much, much more in the detail of the test on our wiki page. And basically, I try to speed it up so we can have any questions, and especially if you need a test. What is important that you can have the Docker 
and you can test it on your own network. Uh, you can Docker, I think, is available from my wiki. So you can have it and you can put it in your network and play it. The tools are installed. So you can you can use it whatever you like. And basically this is all the configuration and how we install them are also on the wiki. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. So any questions to any of the speakers of today? It looks if, like- I mean, if there are no questions, ah, there is a question there from George. Well, uh, IPv6, uh, actually it is supported within the tools. It is on the layer three service. So this is not, not important. Maybe been with the segmenting, but it is supported in the X through D and probably in grid FTP. Yeah. We didn't do IPv6 test because it was very complicated to set it up on the GTS, but yeah. So there's a more general question to the people um, attending is, you know, for the users you have in your owner ends, are you seeing them coming to you asking for help in moving data more efficiently? And if so, are you helping them with science DMZ or DTN deployments or which ways are you helping them? And if no one feels like answering that. Are there any comments on how you think um, NRENs might better help or if there's something that the GM43 project could do further to help? Any comments there would also be very welcome. There is a comment from George Rob in the chat. So maybe if you would like to speak out instead of us reading it to share oh, your certainly. view. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, one of the patterns we've been seeing is uh, being a good citizen on long hauls, uh, especially for some of the, the RINs, being very aware of the path that you're on and making sure that you're not being, for lack of better terms, a packet cannon. Um, so not building the biggest just to do the biggest, but more or less do purpose built. So examples being the 10 gig testing, uh, amazing. Refine that as much as possible. Uh, or even start pushing the limits a little with 40, but not necessarily run against 100 gig. Um, that said, just being a good citizen is one of the things we've been seeing a pattern for. But how would you, how would a, a user or a research community that's moving data around know whether that's the case or not? They would just see the endpoints and the performance they're getting at the endpoints. How would they know about the path and whether they are being a good citizen, whether there is 40, 100 or 800 gig available, they presumably, how would they know that? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I guess part of that is the community, um, having a good engagement with your RIN um, when you're building out a DTN, not hesitating to say, hey, who's up uh, above and, and sideways and next to us, or what is our transit? Um, knowing point to point, uh, we see a lot of really good community, not only from the technical perspective, but even dare I say when the pandemics are places to share a beer with um, just by having that community um, getting the science moved is more than just the uh, ones and zeros there's a lot of hey how can we help or oh have you tried this so uh, not not only taking advantage of building the technology but using the technology as a, a, a lever to help talk to uh, your RINs and your ISPs and your endpoints Any other comments or views that you would like to share? And something about uh, that I would like to say about the Docker part of the IPv6 support. Uh, for Docker, there is only a, a, a single command you can put in the Docker and it will support immediately the IPv6. Uh, we haven't done, as Dan said, the test, uh, but uh, we, in order to we can investigate this. Uh, uh, 
Uh, we have dependency as uh, it said before on the services. So the X would be if they they support the IPv6 or greater FTP that it's old. Uh, so there is thing to be <laughs> uh, done in the future. Okay, if Excellent. there are no more questions, I'll just quickly throw up a, a couple of slides towards the conclusion here. Um, the first one is that um, there is a white paper that's being published today about the, the tests that have been reported in the info share. Um, you can find the link on the, the slide deck that will be in the events page. Um, there's a very not so memorable link there. And the one under it, um, the paper is in the queue to be published at the white paper area of the Giant site. So that will appear there at, um, very soon at some point today. If not, the, the longer link above the direct link will work. You may need to use Edugain to um, access that though. Um, but you can then access the white paper. And again, any feedback from that is, is certainly very welcome. Um, this is just one of about 20 threads of work we have in the um, work package six of the Jean Paul Free project that covers network technologies and service development. Um, and this activity is actually stopping this month with this work concluding. So if there is any interest in it continuing or going in another direction, then that's why the input to us is very important to help make sure the work we're doing in the project is relevant um, to the NRAMs. Um, but there are also many other threads of work we're doing. And here's some further workshops and info shares that are coming up. If you want to see everything that's happening from the project and elsewhere, if you go to the new Jayant events area, events.shayant.org, that has replaced eventr.shayant.org, um, you will see there all the events coming up. The ones that are coming out of our work package, are first of all, uh, an automation one, this time next week, um, the work that's been done on orchestration, automation and virtualization, um, the TM forum ODA reference architecture uh, and things related to that. That's happening next week. Uh, the registration is, is open. And then into next year, we'll have several. These four have already been lined up. So there's a info share in January on quantum key distribution, although it'll also look a little bit more broadly at quantum technologies. In March, we have the optical time and frequency networking uh, workshop. So that will present what various NRENs have been doing with time and frequency services, um, some of the results they've had in the past year and the, the upcoming planned work. Uh, again, in March, we have a workshop on network management and monitoring tools. That's a repeat of one that was held previously. Um, for that one, we'll certainly be interested in people that have got topics they would like to present. So contact us if you'd like to present there. And then the last one is the second running of the European Perfsonar user workshop. So I mentioned at the start of this session that Perfsonar is developed within the Jayon project as a partnership with um, US contributors as well. Um, so that's two days. We'll have one day of users presenting how they're using the tools and what they think is good and bad about it. And a day of developers talking about the upcoming features and the new versions. So one of the main threads of work with Persona that's coming up in terms of features will be on visualization. So input on how you would like to see results visualized would be great. So you can join that to hear from other users and developers and contribute to the, the future of Persona. Um, so those are the five events that are coming up. Other than that, that's all that I need to say. So I'll, I'll hand back to Ivana to uh, close the event. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks to all the speakers and uh, many, many thanks uh, for all of you who joined today. Uh, in the chat, I have posted the email address that uh, you can use for any of uh, further comments or questions that would be more than welcome. So uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, uh, wish you all the best and to see you in uh, one of our future events. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Toby. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.